Hey everyone, it's Daria here. Welcome to the Agile Audit, a podcast where we sit down with your fellow colleagues to talk about the real life Agile and Scrum, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Hi Ryan, thank you so much for joining me today on this episode. And um, we'll, we'll be talking about the role of the Scrum Master, obviously, as always. And I am excited to hear more about your journey, your transition, and kind of how did you become a Scrum Master? So I guess I will start exactly with this question. How did it happen? To be honest, it was a little bit by accident. <laughs> uh, I mean, as often as these things tend to be, you know, I started out my career um, doing a, a bachelor's degree in IT and this is in a rural town um, where I, I was living out of home with a fantastic group of people and, and learning, doing as much learning in the classroom as I was doing uh, learning about life and what it was like to party and get friends and all that sort of stuff. And Really, I started out just through, you know, you might say a normal career transition from there. So like I went into different IT sectors, um, starting off in junior roles and then moving around as I went. You know, my role before I was a scrum master was really in operations um, and my background is around service management and service delivery. And I just had a chance, really was a, a chance encounter with a friend. Uh, they had a project where sort of virtualized infrastructure project that had been running for a little while, but they had this sense of uh, these agile mindset that they wanted to embrace. But they really, do, really didn't have anyone within the team that that sort of owned and championed that. My background, I'd worked around projects, I'd worked inside and supported projects. I'm working in IT and and all that sort of thing. It was a it was a good fit to support the project and. Mm-hmm. There was a growth opportunity there really with the project. And so I just joined and really started taking that by the reins and running with it. And then from there, you know, I started getting certifications. I started doing all the reading up um, and then really injecting that sort of the frameworks, the mindset and starting to, to try to drive change within the team to sort of bring out scrum practices, agile mindset, you know, just the normal stuff that you do around running an agile project. Okay, so and then that basically slowly, I guess you were more transitioning into that scrum master role, or was it originally the the thought you knew that this is something that you will be going for? To be honest, it was so organic. It's it's kind of hard to explain, but I I had an affinity towards it. I'd done other types of work so yeah within the team and my boss gave me a lot of room to to take this role where i wanted to take it he has i've known this guy for a long time and his general way of working is just naturally agile he likes to experiment he likes to move fast and that can mean stuff breaks but you can fix it um, it doesn't always have to be perfect, it just has to be good. And, you know, that sort of approach really let me then just sort of get into this role. I think there were probably some misconceptions about exactly, you know, how the agile mindset and the various frameworks and various things you do, how that, how that works exactly. And within the organization that this project exists within, it's not a naturally agile sort of organization. It's very command and control sort of heavy. But somehow this project and, you know, this pocket of people, we were able to really sort of take that, take that further. I started taking it in a direction like to, to go with a simple sort of implementation initially that was like sort of Kanban focused. It didn't have a lot of the overheads that, that Scrum brings with it. We were trying to implement some of those things as we went. It was a learning journey for me and it was a learning journey for the project as well. However, as soon as we started going on this journey, it became quite obvious the benefits that it would bring. The, the project was already doing a lot right. I mean, it was it's a really successful project and it's a great project, but I think bringing in these sort of, these new elements um, piece by piece, it, really started to sort of supercharge what we could do. We started getting transparency around our work. We started getting more people on the same page about what was going on. And so I guess, yeah, it was that learning journey was really instructive for myself. It was instructive for the team and it allowed, in terms of, yeah, as we go back to the original question around how did it sort of, how did this role sort of come about within the team? It really was a natural progression that just seemed to make sense. And then as soon as it started to click with me about what was going on here, 
uh, I just wanted to keep running with it and I got really hungry to learn more and hungry to do to do this work because it just in a modern sort of context it just seems to make a lot of sense okay good I think it's uh, interesting you're talking about how it, you were able to see how small changes scrum agile changes implemented in the team actually immediately you could see results and i know that a lot of people are having trouble actually showing the value of whatever they're implementing as a scrum master so i would like to hear more about how did were you able to show the results in some way or was it just so natural that even the management and the executive teams where is involved, we're able to see, huh, that is the way to go. We should definitely continue. That is such a great question. And I feel like that is the perennial question for all scrum masters and agile practitioners. Like, oh, how can I actually demonstrate that this is adding any kind of value? And I yeah. think, uh, yeah, and I'd love to put this question to you as well, because, you know, I could learn something. <laughs> maybe, <laughs> maybe, maybe, maybe I'll be more than one person will learn something from this. But look, for us, I think it was so natural. It was so empowering to, you know, for example, you might go from a traditional team structure where you go, oh, we just have a weekly meeting. Everyone gathers around the table. We talk about some issues. We talk about some the next week's objectives and maybe there's a problem that we needed to resolve and you sort of jump around different things and, and maybe the team leader or the project manager or whoever it is sort of has an agenda that they want to run through for the meeting and if someone gets a chance to say something, you know, um, they'll, they'll chip in, you know, a problem they might have or whatever. And that's sort of like a traditional kind of way that, it, that a team might run. And there's, you know, that's fine. And in, and in fact, there's lots of teams I've worked with in where that's totally workable. Mm -hmm. Everything just hums along. Um, I think it gets a little bit more tricky when you're trying to work within a fast paced environment um, that has all the complexity around it, the unknowns, uh, you're running into technical issues, you're running into changes with customers' expectations and customers' requirements and things like that to have this week-long gap between an exercise of everyone getting together. And so within our own project, we'd have sort of longer gaps between, um, you know, sort of inspecting what we were doing, checking how, pro how progress was going, no sort of formal events or anything in between that that would let, that would just naturally let people sync up and, mm -hmm. and, and, and and sort of problem solve in real time. Um, of course, individuals within the team, it wasn't like a toxic environment or anything like that. Individuals within the team would bump into each other. They'd sort of try to solve something and then they'd go on their way. But as you, you know, as I'm sure you can appreciate, that just happens in these isolated bubbles. It doesn't really yeah. disseminate out. And so as soon as we started moving to a practice of like, in the most basic thing of like, okay, let's just do a daily stand up. Let's do that. Mm -hmm. Let's put a Kanban process in. And we didn't sort of half ass a Kanban process. It wasn't, it wasn't like, um, oh, Kanban um, means you just have like to do doing done and just anything goes. Just as long as you've got tickets in there, anything goes. It wasn't that. I spent a lot of time actually researching it and going, <laughs> we're having whip limits. Um, we're not moving stuff backwards in this queue. We're mapping out our knowledge discovery process, you know, how, how works to flow through. And then all of a sudden it was like, yes, there was some push. Oh, what do you mean pull? Can't I just push it to the next guy and all this sort of stuff? It was like you, you get the friction, you get the pushback uh, and all that sort of stuff and you sort of find the happy space. And then once it's sort of soaked in with the team, it's like, oh, look, there's a bottleneck. There's a bottleneck right there, testing. That's a bottleneck. Yeah. Um, <laughs> our, our review, you know, our, our review phase, hey, we're getting a bit of a bottleneck here because we have three people that need to do these reviews, you know, and then you yeah. say, oh, how can we solve that? Oh, how can we solve that? You know, and... And it's like, well, a daily stand-up, you know, we've got this board, we're seeing all this work in front of us now. A daily stand-up is allowing it to be, you know, transparent, can inspect it, we can then come up with ways of changing what we're doing. And so that started. And then it's like, yeah. okay, cool. Well, now we've got, now we've got that going and, th and like everyone's getting it. Like it just makes working better. What, what else can we do? What, you know, what, what can we do next? Well, let's talk about sprints. Let's talk about, you know, um, what, what do we get from that? Oh, we get all this focus and, da -da -da. Oh, let, you know, my boss was like, oh, let's just do sprints. Let's, let's go for it. <laughs> and it's like, whoa, okay. Yep. Let's do it. This is a big change. Um, but, and we did it and we just lent into it. And then naturally, of course, you have to have ways of managing that exercise and you you run into problems as you do it you're like okay well, we're going to do you know we're already doing backlog refinement as part of our practice because 
Yeah, again, you would. I did. Uh, yeah, I, I did X. I made the. You know, I made the blue widget. What did you make the blue widget for? I wanted the. I wanted the. Um, you know, I wanted the green. The green doodad. Ah, oh, well. I didn't know that, you know. Uh, <laughs> it's like, okay, we need to actually define the work. We need to make sure we're going through this process. Now, that wasn't, again, I don't want to make out it was really, really terrible. Or anything. Like, we were doing lots of good work, but you keep bumping into these issues and naturally naturally, these things would just repair themselves and get better by, by putting in the, you know, those practices and those behaviours that, that Scrum brings with it and, and other agile sort of techniques that you can use to define things, run things properly, get that feedback that you need, have that constant communication, you know, that direct communication that you want to have so that people in real time solving problems. So that was really organic for us. And it just seemed to make sense. It seemed to emerge and make sense. And then other people within within our larger branch started to notice as well, like some of the stuff that we're doing, just through its, again, just through its natural value. But I guess, what have you found, Daria? How, how have you, um, maybe in not every case, maybe you might have a fairly high-performing team and it's not like, oh, we have a, you know, we have this incredible way that we can inject this, this process and it's just going to make things better because you can solve all these just obvious problems or, or whatever. How have you found trying to demonstrate value to stakeholders around, you know, the agile practice? It's, uh, as you said, a good question. It's a hard one too, right? Um, a lot of the work that we do is more reliant on quality, I guess, quality of the work, quality of collaboration, and you cannot really put numbers to it. So it's difficult to show what's going on. But I think I'm kind of aligned with what you're saying is that naturally it would, it would show. And I think if you are doing a good job and um, after some time, you will be able to see results, even if you are not maybe saying anything or you're, you're not promoting it to the management, usually the team will. Right. And basically that would be the how you show the value. And I think um, I was working with the um, recent project I was working with. So the new teams and because I'm not there full time, I didn't feel that I was contributing as much. And I was kind of feeling, OK, is it am I really bringing the value to the team? I'm not really feeling it the same way that I would um, normally do if I was there full time. And then I actually got the feedback from the executives who said, no, no, we absolutely, whatever you did, wh whatever you worked on, it got better. I'm like, okay, good. I'm not sure how exactly, but you know, if you feel that it got better, perfect. You know, that it means that it worked, right? Or, you know, just coming to facilitate a meeting, right? So starting off with one of the teams when I first joined some of their meetings, like the sprint planning, they have already been running. They are still still new. After that one facilitation, they went back and basically kind of spread the word. Oh, it was so nice to have Daria there because we were able to stay focused and really do a really good planning that we were not able to do before. And so I feel like those small changes and small wins is how you show value. It's, and it's not a number. It's not something that I can put on a graph and say uh, the team happiness increased by thirteen percent, right? So <laughs> yeah, we made ten thousand more dollars by running this meeting properly or something. Yeah. yeah it's... <laughs> so what is it? So you so they were so happy with what you brought to the team. If you were going to say you know in a sentence or a paragraph or something like you know looking back on that feedback. What was the team not able to do or not able to recognize or do well when you've come in? It's like, this is, you know, from their feedback and what I'm doing, this is really what I'm adding value. Like, it doesn't have to be a number, but yeah, what, what do you think it is? What's that little, that little extra bit of spice or that little thing that we add to teams? I think it's being that outside person, like a fresh eye that looks at things and notices the problems or notices the things that might become problems early on, right? And uh, usually for me, it's more driving the team back and keeping them focused. So, okay, we're, it seems like we're going off topic here. You remember why we're here? We need to do this, right? So let's refocus or um, actually helping them I guess think a bit more than just going with the flow. And that what I think helps, you know, like teams who are just putting in everything into their sprint and like, 
it's 100 story points, but our velocity is 50. Huh, doesn't matter, right? And so you would be the person who says, well, wait a minute, let's get back and let's actually think about it. Let's discuss it because we often, I feel, have this tendency to just, you know, status quo, go with the flow, doesn't matter. And I feel like sometimes we need someone who can like pull you back in and say, hey, wait a minute, let's think about it. Kind of like, you know, if we're going to uh, like a personal trainer for, for sports, which um, the same, right? If you are going and doing it alone, yes, you're going to do something and progress. But when you have someone who is there to correct your, your posture, to say, okay, come on, five more, five more, right? You're kind of feeling much more motivated and feeling more focused. That is such a good analogy of the personal trainer. Uh, I, I love that analogy. I'm going to use that from now. I'm totally stealing that now, Daria. Um, I'm going to claim it as my own. No, I'm not going to claim it as my own. That was, that was really instructive. I, yes, um, and I think, you know, I look at what I'm doing within, within our team, and I know I'm not the only one who forms this role, but um, just to add to what you're saying, I guess, is you almost act like the glue as well. Mm. Because it's really easy, I find, for especially technical-minded people in my industry, for them to get into their zone, I'll just sit in the basement, I'll just tap away on my keyboard. That's totally unfair. There's a lot of great guys at my team, they're awesome. <laughs> but, but you know what I mean? It's like, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I've done my bit and, and over to them. And it's like, hey, hey, hey. Um, I heard such a, a great um, thing the other day uh, from someone saying, you know, you're not a pipe, you're actually a connector. Mm. And I thought that was a really good, a, a cool um, metaphor to use because it's like I had even fallen into the trap of like, oh, I'll be the pipe. Oh, oh you're having a problem? I'll go talk to them and I'll go help solve that problem and we'll, then I'll come back and you'll be happy and everyone will be happy. And then, of course, you know, I'd realise, oh, hold on, hold on. I need these two people to actually come together and solve their own problem and I need to be there um, as that glue to make them feel safe, uh, that they can share this, these issues. Um, yeah, they can be courageous. Yeah. They can actually have trust in each other and, and engage in productive conflict. Uh, because I think that can at times be one of the things that people, it can be a bit of a corporate no-no sort of at the moment in the modern mm -hmm. world. It seems to be like, oh, everyone's got to be nice all the time and everyone's got to be, you know, don't say anything wrong. And I mean, of course, everyone needs to be respectful. That's a hundred percent. That just yeah. goes without saying um, and use diplomacy. But sometimes you need to, you need to be able to, oh, you know, Bob said this, oh, I didn't really, I didn't really get it. I don't think he gets it. Can you go talk to him? Yes, we can go and talk to him. Let's go and get together. And so what did you think this and uh, the, oh, I didn't think that. And then there's a, there can be a little bit of rah, rah, rah. and then it's like, ah, now <laughs> we're happy. You know, uh, I think that goes a long way. And I think it's, it, it's, I've joined teams before where, um, and even in the team that this team that I joined, there was a bit of it where it's like, oh, I think there's some issues simmering here um, that if we don't cast a bit of sunlight on, uh, then they'll just continue to simmer and boil away and people won't work productively together. And then, and then yeah, again and again, just having to, to reflect and learn that you need the team to solve the problems. You need to, that when you have these issues, it's almost like, okay, so you're having the problem, so what do you want to do about it? then maybe, oh, you're not sure what the priority is. Oh, let's do a little priority impact map or let's do a little whatever technique you want to use. Um, and then that's the value. It's like, oh, now it's easier to see what our priority is. Ryan didn't tell me what my priority was, yeah. but we, we solved it through, you know, doing something like that. Mm -hmm. Do you feel that way? I think that those are some uh, definitely good examples and definitely that um, metaphor around the connecting, right, people. I think this is where I feel sometimes it's hard for people to how does it like dissociate from um, am I actually the person who is resolving the problem or am I the person who is connecting the dots so that other people can resolve that, that problem. I think there's often difficult to actually step back from that and really allow the team to potentially self-organize and figure it out, but for you to just be there like a referee, right? 
in a way. To be honest, you know, I think that's, I know one of the things that, you know, you sort of wanted to talk about is one of the biggest misconceptions in the industry, right? And yeah. I, I've had to learn this myself. Um, I've come from organizations that were sort of command and control driven and, you know, you had formal roles and you have formal authority. I mean, those roles, of course, exist everywhere and they need to exist. But, um, you know, I coming in, moving into this space, you know, with that background in more of an operational role, um, strict rules, governance frameworks, sort of prescriptive process around it, um, I brought some of that with me to the team. Mm -hmm. And they had that going on as well within um, within certain aspects of, of our team and within the greater organization that I work at. That's, as I said, that's part of it. And as I mentioned, I pushed the change within the team to, to sort of allow us to be more agile, to be more transparent, get the inspection going, changing what we're doing, learning from doing and all that sort of stuff, um, which wasn't completely foreign, but it was nice to have wrap it up in a nice little bow. But what I found as I was doing that is I started to turn into an advocate and I can be a passionate person. And so that just naturally started to happen and it'd be like, oh, we need to do X and Y and, you know, oh, and these are the reasons why. And, you know, I'd explain it and people would ask questions and people would come along to the journey. Um, but then at times there'd be pushback and I'd start to protect mm -hmm. I'd start to protect the process. I'd start, well, well, no, we're not, no, we're not going to do that. No, 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 we're not going to do that. And it was a self-fulfilling prophecy a little bit because yeah. people would go, oh, that's, that's Ryan. Ryan's the agile guy. And we just, we listen to Ryan about agile and it's like, ah, yeah. oh, whoops. No, no, that's <laughs> not, that's, we're all, we're all on this journey together and I need to get out of your way. And I, mm. I need to be here to support you, remove impediments, facilitate things, you know, bring people together, all that sort of good stuff and get you out of the mindset because that's a lot of people have this mindset that, you know, oh, you will tell us what the process is here. You will tell us um, how this works. And, oh, I've got a problem. I need to go and ask, I need to go and ask Ryan if I'm allowed to do this or if I'm allowed to do that. And, and it's like, oh, yeah, okay. I get, I, like, I like that you're coming to chat with me and we, Let's solve this problem together. Um, you yeah. don't need me to be the the guy that says, "Oh no," and "Oh yes," and I'm a gate, and you can't get past here without my okay. Yeah, yeah I needed to I needed to pull back from that, and then and also I need to let people make mistakes and mm -hmm. do that experimentation, and then bring that own feedback to like a retrospective and go, "Oh, you know, this happened, so we tried to do that, and now I think we need to do this," you know, and 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 so on. And so yeah, I guess to to sum it to sum it up is I think often in more formal structured organizations, especially larger ones, I think there can be this misconception around, uh, or when we get this person in, they need to just be going and just sort of, you know, we, they need to be strong and they need to change people's minds and they need to get their sledgehammer out and make sure that we're, you know, we're coming along for the journey. And then you find out six months later that that, that, that role no longer exists, you mm -hmm. know? Yeah. What about you? What do you do? You find that's the case. Do you find that that people feel like there's a if they're not used to this that they can sort of see the role as something of you know a formal leadership role, like it should have formal authority over the top of it, or have you seen something else? I mean, I think it it depends. <laughs> My favorite answer, but um, really, it's. It is a leadership role, but I don't think that authority should be a part of it, like the official authority in the organization. And I think that's where the differentiation actually happens between a scrum master and say um, a manager of a team, right? The, where a scrum master can be a leader and the same, as you were saying, maybe you're nobody's manager and maybe technically they can make whatever decision they want around the processes. But because they see you as a leader on this topic, they want to go and check with you, right? So now the question is, can you, instead of telling them what to do, direct them, right, and guide them and let them figure it out? And I feel like that is naturally sometimes something that happens, right? If you are helping the team and you say you brought in some good changes that they have never thought of before, so to say, well, seems to be working. I don't want to ruin anything. So I'm just going to keep walking in the same direction or whatever you're taking me, right? Because it's been working. But now you need to stand back and say, no, 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 no. I just showed you the first few steps. <laughs> now it's on to, up to you to actually find the rest of the way. 
And um, I think that transition is very difficult because when we're talking about like the kind of the rules of Scrum, what the Scrum Master role is supposed to be, it's we see, for example, the daily Scrum, where the Scrum Master is not in the daily Scrum. The Scrum Master doesn't have to facilitate all of the events. So there are a lot of things where we can say, well, the Scrum Master doesn't have to be there. But then if you all have a new team, well, you kind of have to hold their hands for some time before you can really let go. And now I think the problem happens is that we're holding their hands for way too long. Oh my God, I was a hand holder. I was like a little parent with my little kids running along going, oh, I'll run this <laughs> meeting, I'll run it, it's all good. And then, yeah, T daily scrum is totally it. Yeah, I, I'm at the front, everyone tell me what you're doing. And it's like, ah, and I even knew when I was doing it, I was like, I've got to get out of doing, I've got to get out of being this guy. I don't even like being this guy, but I just feel like I need to. Yeah, so totally get it. Yeah, the hand-holding thing for too long. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, I'm guilty as charged. Yeah. <laughs> I think there are a lot of us who kind of uh, feel this way a bit. Um, and I think one of the reasons is because it is kind of an expectation that a lot of people actually put on us that, well, you're a Scrum Master, right? You're here full time. So you got to do something if you don't do facilitate meetings and if you uh, don't come to the daily scrums. So what do you do? Sometimes it's so hard, I feel, to explain to people what is the change that you're doing because it's like, you know, explaining what does the CEO do? I, I don't know, but they are very, very busy, right? <laughs> they are never available to come to a call, but what do they do, right? And I think it's in the same way when you take roles like that that are more leadership, more people-based, that it's hard to say, well, what are the things that you're actually doing during the day? Um, and if you're not in the meetings. And I feel that that's why it kind of keeps us longer in that role of facilitating and leading everything. Yep, I'd agree. I'd, uh, yeah, very much agree. Sometimes it can feel a little bit like I better justify my existence. Um, and sometimes it's like, well, right now, what else would I do? Like I'm here. Um, I, I, it's kind of a natural fit, so I'll do it. And you have to get a little bit uncomfortable sometimes. And in fact, I took an opportunity with our team where one of our guys was like, he just walked up to the board and was like, oh, I'm just going to start talking to it. And it was like, oh, this is a, this is amazing. Oh, I'm stepping back. And then we just went around the room and I'm like, ah, oh, this is so good. This happened. And now we're sort of, now we're continuing to run with that. It, it can be a bit of an exercise sometimes in just, showing people that you're there to support um you're not always there to just run everything yeah yeah definitely um i was telling um, a funny story when i was uh, teaching a class about it when the same was kind of part of the dailies all the time and i was trying to get away from it and stop being there and i what i started doing because we were in the office sitting in the same area i just started going for coffee breaks exactly at the time of the daily. <laughs> I'm like, sorry, I've, I've, you guys do the daily. I, I need to go. And then I came back after one daily like this. And one of the developers came to me and said, like, I know you weren't there, but I like felt as if you were staring in my back <laughs> the whole time. <laughs> so I was always thinking about, okay, if Daria is not here, but what would she say? <laughs> That's good in a way. I think it's, it's kind of keeping the discipline. It's like, you know, people are just slack off and oh, whatever, you know. Yeah. yeah, it's funny. I think like sometimes you just need to let go and then that will sometimes show you that the team is really cap capable of doing a lot of these things and maybe they will not have the best solutions or on processes at the beginning, but eventually they will get there, right? And in the end, it's not like, you have the best answers every single time. Well, yeah, and I think that also unlocks the power of the event. So, you know, if a scrum master is hanging around all the time in all of these different events and, and sort of running them perhaps always, um, I don't have a problem running these things on a fairly regular basis, but if, like you said, if you do give them that space, it's like, oh, this isn't a status meeting anymore. Ryan's not here or the scrum master's not here to be like, 
oh, okay, and I'm talking to you, and I'll tell you what I, what I did yesterday and what I'm doing today and all this sort of stuff. It's like, no, 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 you don't have to do that. We've got a whole bunch of people in this room that you can sync up with, you can, you can, you know, unblock things with, you know, you can alert that they'll pick up on something that you've said and then they'll want to problem solve with you or learn what's happening so that they can, they can navigate around that or whatever it is. And if I'm not there, you're suddenly going to ask, what is the point of this? Mm -hmm. And if you've got a brain in your head, you're going to go, well, I've got all my team members here and, you know, I need help from um, Sally. So I'm just going to tell her right now. I don't have to give a status update. It's Sally's right there, and I'll just, just I'll just sync up with her. So yeah, I think I think sometimes the absence um, of of a scrum master gives people the space to actually just recognise and have that the value of that meeting will actually land with them because they have to sort of take ownership mm -hmm. of it from that point forward. Yeah, uh, good examples. There was something that you mentioned a bit earlier that I actually wanted to follow up on. It's one of the things around, um, I guess, making changes in the process, the rules, right? As you were saying that uh, people would kind of say, oh, we need to go to and check with uh, Ryan whether this is a good change or that like we can do this change and it's aligned with whatever framework we are implementing. And there are some certain rules that we definitely want to keep, well, keep implemented and not change. We cannot really like cherry pick everything. So how do you find the balance between being like a, a scrum police as like, no, 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 we're not changing that and allowing people to find the way, but still like keep them in the right boundaries. I, I've totally been that person that says, no, we're not changing that. And then I've realized that was a mistake. By the same token, you know, you're so on the money here with this question because there can also be this huge misconception. Probably the other giant misconception is that anything goes, they're agile. Yeah. Like that just means, that just means tailor everything to our business. Yeah. There's, there's no, forget standards, forget documentation. Why would you worry about that? That can all come later. That's document debt. It's a tightrope walk sometimes, uh, which I fall off regularly and then I have to sort of again you know just relearn some of these lessons and you, you do you get I, I get better at it um, as I go you know doing courses like yours has helped me to, to gain techniques on on dealing with these sorts of things but it's like I guess in some ways every framework it's like every set of agreements and rules that we have um, one of the biggest things I've learned is to make team agreements explicit mm -hmm. And it's a journey because it's this balance between going, I don't want to have 50 posters on the wall with like, you know, 20 dot points on each one and then just pull out my little scrum guide and say, D -d 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 -d, you know, because people go, oh, right. <laughs> but I think making team agreements explicit and, and trying to get those agreements as early as you can starts to bring everyone in on the conversation, everyone buying into what's going on because they've actually created it themselves. Yeah. And so when they come with a question, they, where they're like, oh, you know, should I do X or should I do Y? In many instances, it's a case of going, well, do, so do you think that you think you finished this job and you want to, you know, you want to close it out or whatever? Well, we have a definition of done. Um, and we have a workflow here. So really, I guess I'll just put that back to you. Is that, if we look at this, do you think we have done it? I mean, this is what we said. Oh, it's just a small job. And like, you know, we sort of already did it last sprint. And this is just the cleanup and don't worry about it. It's all fine. And like, I, that's great. That is awesome. As long as you think everyone else within the team will agree with that. And as long as you think you've met our agreement here, then that's fantastic. And then it, it just comes to light that in fact, maybe maybe they have done it or maybe they haven't but it just it just sort of all it all just sort of washes out because other people other interested parties within the team are going to start going well oh, hold on a minute the security aspect you, you didn't run it past me and so but then sometimes there's actual gaps in what we're doing or we're doing listening i think is super important and you, and you have to take on board the feedback like oh it says we do this but you know i don't know like is that really what we're going to do um sort of taking that on and going yeah actually, this, this is a good question. I think we do need to establish something here or change, change what we're doing 
because otherwise we're just going to get results that we're not we just aren't valuable or we're just going to double up on effort or whatever mm -hmm. whatever it might be and then at other times like i can give you an example of um, something where within our team you know we have review points along the way of delivering something mm -hmm. and i form part of that review i don't want to form part of that review but you know what it doesn't matter while i might not necessarily think i add a lot of value by being a part of that part of the process, I don't really slow anything down. You know, there is a little bit of value I add to this this step. That was the team's idea. They wanted to do it. And I said, oh, am I really doing anything here? Am I actually sort of contributing to this part of the review? Like technically all this aspect is taken care of and now I'm doing this checkbox at the end. Oh, we think it's important and, you know, there's a quality aspect that you'll be able to add to it. No worries. Okay, I can accept that. I can accept that. And that's probably, you know, one of the things I learned from um, a book called Five Dysfunctions of a Team, which mm. you, know, you probably know about. It's a fantastic yeah. book. And I really had to learn there it was around moving from consensus to acceptance. That was a breakthrough, really, a light bulb moment for me around going, you know, I don't have to absolutely convince everyone of everything and have 100% agreement, yeah. you know, that this is perfect. We just have to be able to say, oh, okay, okay, I'll, I'll just stand behind this plan. I might not agree with every aspect of it, but I can live with it. I can live with yeah. it. We can run this experiment. And that's something I had to do for myself. That might be a long-winded way of answering your question <laughs> about when people come and either push back against, you know, something or want to inject their their ideas in. But I think it comes down to listening and just being honest about inspecting what we're, what we're doing um, and making sure that it, that it really makes sense. And then where it does, the thing that I find most powerful and that I don't always do but I have to make sure I do it more often than I do is bringing the team in mm -hmm. so you've said you don't like that idea or you don't want to do that thing okay cool these are the reasons why but let's put it to the group and if it's a solid idea almost always the group will just start to defend the idea and people go okay yeah I get it so mm -hmm. that's my approach when I take those type of things what about you what how do you deal with when someone maybe challenges something or well, how do you deal with something that you go, no, no, this really is important. Like, mm -hmm. I really don't want to change this. What tactic do you use there? Kind of in the same way to putting it back to the team. But here's what I think is important is to say, okay, so say, oh, we don't want to do a daily scrum every single day, for example, right? the common example. And say, okay, great. Uh, so here is why we're doing daily scrum. Um, the goal is by the end of it to have a plan for the day for the whole team so that we know that we are advancing towards our sprint goal. Um, we don't have to do daily scrums, but you need to explain to me how you're going to create that plan otherwise. What's your plan to create that plan? Like, how are you going to replace it? Yes, we don't have to do it that way, but you still need to achieve the goal of that meeting if it exists. So what's your approach? How do you want to do that? And then that's up to you. If you have no idea how to do it otherwise, well, then I guess it's daily scrum. <laughs> so put it back to them to solve their own problem. Yeah, to say, okay, great. Well, I mean, I don't, I'm not married to, daily, to the daily scrum. We don't have to do it every single day, but you still need to give me a solution for the same problem. And so in the same way, we can say, oh, we don't have the, uh, the time for, for whatever, for a sprint review. Great. So when are you talking to the st stakeholders then to collect their feedback before the next sprint? Do you know, like, do you have a plan? And I think that that's often kind of going back to, to these questions and saying, kind of bringing back the purpose of the different events, like if we're talking about events more specifically, or the purpose of whatever we're doing, right? For example, like we're talking about Kanban and we have work in progress limits and, right, someone says, no, let's let's increase our work in progress limits, you know? Work in progress limits don't apply to me. I can do 50 things at once. Yeah. Yes, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And so it's more of going back to why are we doing that? And okay, if you don't want to use the work in progress limits, great, but what's your solution to the problem? Then? If you have one, maybe perfect, you know, that, that, that works, right? For example, I heard of um, a team who was not doing daily scrum, but they were actually doing mob programming all of the time. So they didn't need the daily scrum because they were constantly working together as a group. It's like the pair programming on steroids, right? Yeah, right. The mob programming. So 
you know, if you're getting to the purpose of that event, doing what you're doing without having to have a 15 minute meeting in your calendar, great, then feel free to adapt it. As long as you have an answer and it's a good answer, then go for it, experiment with it. Is that sort of the takeaway? Do you yeah. Think? Yeah. I think that that's uh, in a way, but also, um, you know, sometimes just um, letting it happen and say, well, you know, let's see how it goes. Now, an example I, I often give here, we had trouble with the dailies, people coming on time for the dailies in the morning. And so I'm like, okay, we need to have this conversation somehow. Morning seems it doesn't work. So what, what are we going to do? Oh, let's do the daily at 4 p.m. I'm like, okay, that's a terrible idea. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, you know, if you, everybody is on the team and thinks it's a, a good idea, everybody, okay. Cool. Well, starting from today, we're going to start doing dailies at 4 p.m. Didn't last that long because it was a terrible idea. Sometimes you just let it go and say, you know, go ahead. I'm going to be there to catch you <laughs> when you fall, you know, but at some point I also need you to be able to explore and try new things and maybe make some changes and maybe cherry pick a little bit. Now you brought up a really good example just a minute ago, the sprint review. And how do you, like, if I say the most, there's some events sort of around Scrum that just seem really obvious in their value. Like a daily stand-up, you can kind of just sell it. Like, you're right, at first people kind of can push back and go, oh, 15 minutes minute every day. Oh, oh. You say it's only 15 minutes, just try it for a week. And then often, like within our team, it, it sort of just came about. It was like, oh, okay, no, this actually works. This is fine. This this makes sense. But, you know, the backlog refinement, it's like you, you quickly get confusion around what is this, what does this item even mean? And we keep not delivering the things that we thought we were going to deliver. And backlog refinement comes around. I mean, that might be a little bit of a harder sell, but once people get it and they're like, no, this is really valuable. Retrospectives, I think emotionally, once you get a retrospective going, this is just my experience. It probably varies. The mileage probably varies across all different organizations. So maybe this is a little bit um, parochial to my sort of experience. But, we, you know, running retrospectives, the emotional investment from the team is high. And so I think they, um, sometimes they forget the value, I think, because they're like, oh, that do we, oh, we're going to run a retrospective. But then afterwards they're like high-fiving and they're like, mm -hmm. oh, thank God we get to talk about and get these things off our chest and we've got some actions that we're going to do and all this stuff. And it's like, this is the best meeting I've ever been to. <laughs> um, it's like, well, it's all about you guys. That was all you. And you're like, how cool is it to, to actually have a space that you can improve and, and, and share some of your, your emotion in? That's awesome. The sprint review is probably one of the ones that what do you do like when you have a maybe a product owner that isn't so invested in the product like you might work inside of a larger organization where they're like look as long as this thing works uh, i know there's a team that looks after it and i know that there's um some stuff going on and that's great what i really you know, from my perspective, I just don't want there to be fires. I don't want there to be people screaming about the product not working. So you know it's valuable. Anyway, and the team's beavering away. And then you sort of ask yourself, oh, what's the, in that instance, what does a sprint review bring? Um, how do we sell? I mean, I know, I have ideas on why you want a sprint review, even if it's internal to the team, so that you know that there's a point that, I'm not going to actually, I'm not even going to answer that question because then I'm just, <laughs> I'm going to throw this to you actually. How do you, yeah, couch the value of the sprint review if you're in a situation like that when maybe the product owner isn't totally non-existent, but perhaps they're a bit distant from the product. They know that it's, that it's sort of working, but maybe their level of investment in its improvement and its, its general daily, like its general health um, sort of thing isn't as high as some other really enthusiastic product owners who, who are all over the product. How do you deal with that from a, from a sprint review perspective? In this case, well, generally you would want to find someone who cares because otherwise your whole team can just go home <laughs> and not do anything, right? So who will be upset if the team doesn't do anything? And so I think you're trying to find the person who does want to know, uh, who, who is, is interested in what's going on with the product. And um, you're trying to get them involved because that's the thing is kind of the long term. And maybe that's where you can coach the product owner is, do you want to demotivate the team 
or, or not. If you want to demotivate the team, let's cancel sprint reviews and never talk about what the team delivered. But if you want to have a motivated team even a year from now, we need a way to show to them why they are doing this work. And I think in a way, it's kind of thinking, yes, you are maybe in a good situation right now, but will you be in a good situation a year from now if you're continuing kind of doing some of those bad patterns, such as not having a sprint review, for example, right? And I think it's more of kind of planning in for, for that uh, future as well. Um, and in the meantime, trying to find a person who could be coming in and uh, interested, whether it's just an internal user or someone like that who would be able to jump in and provide some feedback. Yeah, right. What are, what are some of your ideas on this? It's really good. Like I like that motivation aspect that you just talked about. I think that makes a lot of sense because if you have some stakes that you're dealing with. You're, it's like there's someone else outside of this team. You know, the product that I work with, we're a motivated team. It's a great product. Um, you know, there's a lot going for it. So the, the motivation's there. Um, and we have someone who's really working as the proxy product owner. There is someone who really s sort of informally, they wouldn't recognize themselves necessarily as the product owner. They call it something different than, than our organization, but that, that's what they do. And they do have an interest in, in it. They aren't completely, like they're there. Um, but in terms of that sort of connection that perhaps that they would want to have with the product, if some other product owners would have, maybe isn't as strong um, as, as it could be. So what you talked about around this, around having those those stakes around going, I need to show this to someone outside of our team and they'll give me feedback. And now all of a sudden I'm super motivated to deliver something of high quality, really understand what we're doing here because I've actually got to yeah. please like a, someone and, and, and their needs, not just what my technical yeah. understanding of this product is. That totally makes sense. I'd also probably say even internal to the team, one of the value adds um, I think this, this event can add is that you actually have a point at which we will look at what has been done. If you just miss that event, you go, it, do, and, you know, it doesn't have to be a long and laborious exercise, but you just sort of go past the, we were doing a sprint and now we're doing a retrospective where everyone gets to talk about how, you know, the issues and the cool things that happened and all the great stuff and, and whatever else. But did we, did, was there any confusion about what we actually finished? Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, there was actually, there was confusion. Um, but just keep, keep going with it. Don't worry, just mm -hmm. carry on and, and carry it over and do it in another sprint or, you know, do it as a side thing until you just finish off that bit, whatever that bit might be. And so I think even internal to a team, I think if you have some kind of uh, occasion, where it's like, oh, actually, we now need to sit around and look at this and ask the questions and make sure, yeah. you know, go back to the definition of done. Make sure that we hit those, you know, our agreements around that sort of stuff because you might say it's done, but it's not actually done. Um, and that's really important because then it will just, yeah, our, our quality will improve. So, yeah. yeah. I think uh, just what, as you were also speaking, I thought about, like, an example that you maybe can try to maybe play more on the emotional side of things as well with the person who maybe thinks that it's unnecessary is to, I'm pretty sure everybody in their career had this where someone comes to you on like Friday late, like almost end of the day. And it's like, oh, I really need this presentation. I know it's late, but can you please, like, I really need this. And so you spend two extra hours at work to finish this presentation, you send it out and you never hear back. Like, how does this feel? <laughs> well, do you want the team to have this feeling every single sprint, right? Because they just send it out and, and they don't know what happens next. <laughs> Something happened. They just hope, they like cross their fingers that someone actually cares. Someone read it, you know? <laughs> yeah, that's such a good way of putting it. Where I am, there definitely is a care factor and we are going to be doing, we've got sprint reviews programmed in now, but having that ammunition behind the idea to be able to sell it and to be able to get people to buy into it. I think that goes a long way. I think in the emotional yeah. aspect, to be honest, 
emotional creatures and to give people that story and that sort of feeling, like you said, I mean, how many times have we been in that position where someone said, oh, I need the report or I need the yeah. presentation, please get that done. And you send it off and you don't have a clue whether what's happened. And yeah, I think, yeah. I think teams could definitely fall into that trap. Absolutely fall into that trap and, and also fall into a little trap of um, just a whole bunch of technical debt building up as well. So yeah. It's like uh, someone said that we've done it, but I'm going to keep beavering away in the background, and that's going to take some of my capacity, and so it's going to it's now going to risk the next sprint that we go on, and eventually you find the little gremlins. Do you find that sometimes you, the little gremlins are hiding in the corner that yes. that are hidden <laughs> under the rug and that are whatever you sort of trip over and go, hold on, I thought we I thought we fixed that thing up, and isn't that done? <laughs> oh, it's done. It's not documented, and yeah, no one's no one's updating it, and. Ah, oh, so it wasn't done, <laughs> you know? Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, kind of. Uh, you're just basically every time uh, opening the Pandora box and like, is there anything there? Okay, <laughs> seems to be empty this time. <laughs> Close it. Close it quickly. <laughs> <laughs> empty Pandora's box. Oh, wow, you're lucky. Yeah. <laughs> good. Yeah, that's uh, good, good examples and definitely uh, um, some ways of how you can get the people, the stakeholders, the POs on board with uh, something like a sprint review. That obviously takes extra time and uh, that just may, might be difficult to show the, the value of it that easily. I'm looking at the time and I think that we uh, should be wrapping up um, right now. I think it was an awesome conversation. I had a lot of fun, some great stories that we're able to talk about. I still have one question for you. Uh, that I asked everyone is what would be one most essential piece of advice that you would like to give to Scrum Masters, people who are listening to us? One. Yes. Jeez. <laughs> you put me on the spot, Daria. Um, <laughs> one essential piece of advice. I would say that if you are interested in becoming a Scrum Master, absolutely anyone can do it. But I think you have to have uh, the right personality for it. And one of the best books I've ever read was called Extreme Ownership by Jocko Willink. He's a Navy SEAL. And it has, the lessons from that book have endured with me ever since I read it mm. uh, many years ago. And I think that you have to be someone who can be humble, which I'm not always, uh, regularly fail at. My kids will tell you that and you really need to be able to listen. So there are tools and techniques uh, online uh, everywhere now. I mean, they're all over the place. And the great thing about the Agile community is that, they, is that they're constantly sharing information, sharing different strategies and different tools and different bits and pieces around everywhere. And it's really, really good. I mean, you know, your YouTube channel is a classic example of just it's free information that's just flowing and there's lots of other great YouTube channels out there. And so you can you can start picking this up and there's obviously certification courses and all that sort of stuff. But I think if you want to get into this role, you really want to have, you want to take ownership of failures, you want to take ownership of, you know, successes and, and share those successes with the team. Obviously, it's never about just you. It's really, it's honestly, it's all about the team. And... Maybe this is just me, but I do feel like you need to have an inquisitive mindset as well. It, again, this comes back to the personality thing. You, you can't just sort of go cookie cutter. Yep, 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 yep. You, you need to take that feedback, let it sink in, you know, reflect back to the team, dig in a little bit into things and, and not always think that you're right. You know, you, it's sort of a motherhood statement, but you have to, you know, as I said in some of my other stories uh, there, we sort of talked about, you know, not, not necessarily coming in as the, you know, drill sergeant and, uh, and just being like, oh, that's it. We're just doing it this way and da -da 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 as, the, as the manager. I think it really is important to stay humble, to listen uh, and to sort of, yeah, keep adapting your own practice and have that hunger to adapt and learn in, in your own way. I think that's, that's probably the, one of the key things that I've learned from my exposure in, in this space. An awesome advice. <laughs> I know that I put you in the, on the spot there, but <laughs> I think that's well, how I get the best advice. <laughs> what, what about you? What's your number one? Do you have... <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, you're you're throwing it back to me. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah. <laughs> oh, one piece of advice. Mm, 
I think one of the things that generally, well, and, and not only as a Scrum Master, I think generally in, in life, I, something that would be important is to not be afraid of failure and actually be ready to learn from it. Um, I think often we are actually not getting all of our opportunities because we maybe haven't tried because we're, we're afraid to fail. It's like you are failing 100% of the opportunities that right, you didn't try, like you didn't get. So it's more of trying it out and sometimes it's not going to work. And I think I talk about, about it, especially when I talk about uh, building facilitation skills, right? You're going to fail. It's going to hurt. It's going to be extremely awkward. You're going to hate it. But the most important thing is that's how you're going to be able to develop and continue to grow and, you know, build your skills. And I think this is especially true about the Scrum Master role because there are no like really ways to know what is going to work in which situation. So you need to try it out and see what works. You know, some things that you maybe worked for you previously with one team are not going to be working for you with this other team. And it's more about, hey, discovery, curiosity. What, what else can I do? Let me try something new. I love that. That is so true. I'm going to make sure I hold on to that. Awesome. Great. Thank you so much for your time today. It was really a pleasant conversation. Lots of great insights. And thank you everyone for listening in. And um, I hope to see you in the next episode. Mm -hmm.